Hello, hello. Okay, good morning. Good morning, right morning. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josh Kaplan. Uh, welcome to the interactive Apex debugging session. I'm going to be tour guide today through an exciting new feature that we're going to be releasing next year for debugging your Apex programs. And as always, wherever I go, I am followed by the Safe Harbor slide. So uh, do not make any purchases based on forward-looking statements. Make any purchases based on publicly available information. If you really want to read this, it's on the website. I can imagine it'd be hard to read now, so we're just going to go past. And you've seen this all before, right? Everyone's seen this? Phenomenal. Again, my name is Josh Kaplan, product manager at Salesforce. I work on, with the Apex team and with the platform developers to, developer tools teams. I'm joined today by many of the members of the developer tools team. These are the guys who do all the real work here. I just get to get up and, and talk a lot. They're the real programmers. Uh, you know I'm a real programmer just like, because I, I write perfect code all the time. That's how you know, uh, and I'm sure, sure, sure most of you do as well, almost all the time at least, right? And the trouble is that when you write something that's perfect all the time, when you don't get it right, it's really hard to find what you did wrong. It might have been an old point or exception that you swore you caught, but it's hiding somewhere in your code. Maybe it's data that was incorrectly written to a field that you didn't expect, or an object that wasn't created at all. Uh, maybe it's a very complicated math operation or string JSON serialization that you can't do in your head. Difficult things that are hard to, 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 to just kind of work through by staring at the code. Before I was a product manager, I was in services at Salesforce, and I did implementations, working with customers, and writing Apex code. So I've been on, on the other side of the equation, and I know how difficult it can sometimes be. So currently, our developer tools in the platform for debugging are a little bit primitive. You're looking for a needle in a hay field, and we haven't given you all the tools to find it very easily. Uh, the, you know, I, I grew up in the Midwest. I've seen fields like this before. Uh, I know there are different tools. and I'm sure these guys know there are different tools to do what they're doing. I'm going to guess that most of you have worked on other languages and have seen other interactive debugging tools that are much more rich uh, to work with than ours. The common pattern to do today is the most basic pattern. You write a system.debug statement. And I'm very familiar with this because when I first learned to, 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 you know, to debug things in college, my college courses, this is how I debug things. And I won't say when that was. It was last century. That's all I'll say. Uh, and sometimes it's not even an option. Sometimes you can't recompile your code because it's in production somewhere. So you guys know there's something better. And we know there's something better, too. And rather than keep you working on the way you're doing now, we're going to go and take a step forward and provide modern debugging tools for use on the platform. Before we go there, let's do a little history. How did we get to this day? When Apex arrived in 2007, the only thing you could do debugging with was the system log. Who remembers the system log? Anyone remember that? A few hands going up. Where the developer console link is now on your name, there was a thing that said system log. It basically just gave you raw text. Raw log, raw output, which you could you know, control F in your browser, or you could paste into another window. I remember pasting into Excel to get the timings right and stuff, uh, do more formulas to split it up. It was pretty basic. Uh, it, it could get the job done like those threshers could, but it wasn't exactly the easiest. So fast forward to 2010, fast forward to the Buttworks, the, uh, uh, we created Apex CSI, which you now know as the developer console. We formatted the log output so it's easier to see what's going on. We put timings in there. Uh, we've linked it to the source so you can see where you're at in the source code. Uh, you can see the stack. Uh, we teased that out. Still not what you're looking for, 100% of what you're looking for. So we tried to get a little farther on with checkpoints. Checkpoints feature lets you put something that looks tantalizingly like a breakpoint in the gutter. And after you run a transaction, you can see more information. You can see the heap at that time. You can run the arbitrary Apex code at that time. You can run a SQL query at that time. It gives you a little more data. But still, it's like this guy over here on the right. He's got a better tool now, but he's still dreaming of something better. He still thinks he could do better than this. And so we're going to move forward. Next year, we'll be releasing an interactive debugger for Apex. All right. so. Let's just jump right into this here. Before I debug, I'm going to need some demonstrations. What scenario am I going to debug? I've got two that I'm going to do today, so to uh, demonstrate what's happening. I'm going to de debug triggers, and I'm going to debug uh, a Visual Force page. Now, for triggers, I'm going to do some JSON serialization, because that's particularly painful. It happens personally. I've been working on something around that, so I know. And uh, we're going to be debugging an action method inside of the Visual Force page. So hopefully, this will hit close to the mark. Most of you guys will have done something similar, and you'll be able to relate to these here. How's this trigger, uh, trigger scenario going to work? Anyone here worked with JSON serialization or deserialization, like having to do it by hand on your own? It's fun, right? It makes you do one of those, right? Very difficult. Headache inducing. So I've got a trigger that's going to serialize out my account and contact information. It's going to ship it off to another endpoint for integration purposes. 
The output's going to look something like that. If you can squint hard enough, you might see some of your friends like Burlington Textiles Corp and Edge Communications this is your standard developer edition template information. But if you squint not so hard, uh, you'll see right here uh, for the street, I've got some information that doesn't look quite right. That's not the street. That's the street and the city and the state and the zip in the country. And that's bad. I don't want that. I want just the street there. So what's wrong? I need to figure out what happened in my code. So there's two ways we can approach this uh, with the developer console and then with the new debugger. Let's jump into the developer console and see how we would do this today on the platform with both the debug logs and with the checkpoints and the heap dumps there. All right. I'm going to try to do like this. This is going to be fun. So if I come over here into the developer console, here's the class. Of, I don't, you're not going to try to read all this code, I know. So let me just show you. Here's the method that I'm working in. Serialize one contact. I'm trying to serialize the information for one contact. And this little loop at the bottom is where I think my problem is, yeah? Because as the mailing street was wrong, I'm outputting it to a string, and I'm going to try to put this into my JSON generator. So that's the only part we need to really focus on uh, for the sake of ease. You'll notice that I've got this uh, checkpoint here in the gutter so that when I run, I will get more information come out of my class. When I run, I'll get a debug log. You guys are all probably familiar with this. Uh, we'll see right here uh, that you'll, you'll find street name right here, 312 Constitution Platt. 23 more. It's frustrating. It's truncated. It doesn't give me the information I need. Where is it? Why have I truncated the string? We don't do this because we're trying to be mean. We're doing this because we need to keep the log size small. There's a limited amount of space on our, our servers for your logs. That's why we have a maximum size on them. And if we wrote out every single string every time, you guys would hit that cap very quickly. So we truncate them. It means you can't find all the information you need in these debug logs here. So we've got the next bit here, which is our utility class. Uh, sorry, our checkpoint in the utility class. Shrink that up. Screen resolution is now right. You'll see here, uh, I ran a checkpoint at line 37. You saw that over here in my code, utility class 37. Here was the variable information at that time. So now I can see more. I can see street name, value. I can look over here and I see street name, exactly what was written out before with the commas, not exactly what I wanted. But I can also see the contact, C, that I wrote it from. And as I look at this here, I'll notice I'm missing my fields like mailing city, mailing country. And I think I found my problem. My problem is that the data was incorrect. See, I told you I wrote perfect code, right? So the data was wrong. I had all the information in the street field, and that's why I was writing out that way. So this heap gives me more information than debug logs. Uh, I've also got over here on this side, you can come and look at all the accounts I was working with and all the contacts. But you don't know where they were in the stack or, or kind of which variables you're looking at. So there's more information here. Sure, I got Sean Forbes and I got Rose over here, but this is not easy to follow. This isn't the tools you're expecting. It gets you closer. It gets you farther, but it doesn't quite get you all the way. So if I, oops, if I come over here to this, we find, yeah, we look at Rose, Rose Gonzalez here. If we open this up, sure enough, whoever created this data created it in such a way that the information is in the wrong field. I found my problem, and I'm going to move on. But we can do better. So there we go. And now, so without further ado, I am pleased to present for the first time ever the world's first multi-tenant interactive debugger. Here we go. All right. So, and I gotta shrink my screen again. Screen resolution, apologies. There we go. So, here we are in Eclipse. Uh, we are borrowing the user interface from Eclipse. We're not, gonna, we're not writing our own. We're just going to use the same UI. If you've ever debugged in Eclipse, it's going to be the exact same as what you're used to. Uh, you'll see I've got my force.com perspective, and I've got some, some classes and some triggers that are open here. You'll also notice that I've got breakpoints set, right? So I've got a breakpoint here on this line. In fact, I can come over here, and I can see a list of all the breakpoints I have. I have one on line 15 in my trigger. And if I double click on this one, it will take me through to line 35 in my utility class. This was that same piece of code I asked you to, to look at before where I had the problem. So I've got a breakpoint set right there so I can figure out what's going on by stopping my execution at that point. All right, let's jump in. Let's do this here. So now I'm going to start a session. The way we start a session is the same way we'd start a debugging session anywhere else. Click by my little bug up there and select my configuration. And now what I'm telling it is I want my org to be debugged. Everything in my org now is going to be debugged. Whether I come through and do this now, if I run it from execute anonymous here, if I go to a browser and I uh, or run something that hits a breakpoint, if I have an Apex web service or an asynchronous job, every transaction is now being debugged, whether it's me, somebody else. Anything that hits this breakpoint is going to stop. The whole org is now on, on notice to be debugged. So let's go ahead and find a way to hit that breakpoint. Come back over to my, uh, my account here. Oops, getting ahead of myself. And I will change this account. 
So once I change it, that should fire off some triggers, and I click Save. And you'll notice here that it still says saving, dot, dot, dots. And it will continue to say saving, dot, 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 because I hit a breakpoint. So my execution is now stopped, and it's been trans transferred over here to me in Eclipse. I can see here where I'm at. I'm at this particular spot in the, in the execution. Uh, that's the line I'm at in my class. I have all my commands that I expect to see in a debugger here. Step into, step over, step out. I've got run to daylight over here. You may also notice that the two, two lines prior to this were debug lines. I've got this thing says child contact list, and then I actually wanted to debug out the child contacts. Down here in the console, I've, got, I've been doing that. So if I scroll, you'll see here, I have a small screen, can I go out here? You'll see I've debugged out child contact list, and here I've debugged out the actual contacts themselves. I'll be building the console output with system debug, just like you would with the system out printlin in Java as the execution goes forward. So let's go forward. Let's step through. Let's step into this particular class. Let's step into the utility class. Click that button. You'll see it'll transfer over. Now I'm at the first line of that class. Uh, you'll see the different variables that are associated with this class. Here's what I passed in, my list of contacts. Within the list of contacts, I've got two different S objects. I'm going to expand this window to make it so you can see a little bit better. So I get a little, little uh, teaser of what each of them is. If I click on it, preview shows up down here. And if I expand it, I see all the individual variables associated with that particular contact. So I've got variable information on S objects. And if I step forward, I'll see other variables, uh, uh, member variables, and other Apex variables as well. Let's do that. So I step forward. I'm going to close this up. And now we look at this is JSON generator right here. I'll have to actually step through a couple times to get to something interesting there. But I'm doing some stuff over here, write number field, write string field. And as I step through that, you will notice that I can look at the innards of that, uh, the generator as it's going. Our apex types, we're now going to be able to expose things as they go. Can't see that today. If you try to do a system debug on that thing, you have to write the string on that terminates the JSON generator, making it very difficult to figure out what's going on. But now I can see it as it's being built going forward. Now I'm going to click Run. I'm going to run, it, run in my next breakpoint, which we set at the right point for me to be able to look at what I'm doing. Stack is getting built, utility class line 35. That was called from here, utility class line 15, serialized one contact, called back here from my JSON trigger. You might notice the variables change. Now that I've clicked back up the stack, I can see the variables in the trigger. And I click through. Now I see the variables available to me in that method. I think the real story here is this looks like debugging anywhere else. It's not different. It's the way you're used to it being. And now it's working on the platform. Now it's working with Apex. So just like before, I can step through and see what's wrong. I open up my contact. I see the, the information's incorrect. Aha, slash n. I've debugged it here. But now I've done it in an interactive way. I can run through again. Hit run. It'll show me the next contact. And I should run. It should finish. Actually, no. It didn't finish. I'm back where I started from. Why am I back where I started from? I don't know. Let's take a look. If I go to the stack, I'll notice that the bottom of the stack is now something different. Update contact account type. I click on that, I see I had an after trigger on accounts that must have also fired. And that thing updated some contacts. And when it updated contacts, I had another thing fire. And that thing updated some accounts. And that's how I ended up back in my account trigger. So one of the fun nuances of our system is that we have sometimes the ability to run the same trigger multiple times. And it makes it very difficult sometimes to kind of grep your spot in the code and know where you're at show you right here exactly what the stack is, and you can figure out exactly where you are inside of your DML operation. All right. Oh, yeah. It's going to be so much better now, isn't it? So let's move on to another scenario. I promised you I would do some visual force. Uh, here's the visual force page. I'm showing all the accounts, again, all your friends, Burlington Textiles, United Oil and Gas Corp. Uh, and I've got a button up here that will let me uh, take accounts that are cold and hide them. Because I don't want to really think about them. I just want to work on the other ones. As I click on this button, it should come back with my cold accounts. There we go. And oh, wait a minute. They're still there. Why are GenePoint and S4 still there? What is so special about them that they would not go? So I'm going to go try to debug this. So I pop this back open. I want to see what was before them. And so I can uh, step through my code. So we got Express and then Gene Point, and we didn't get rid of Gene Point. Hmm. To the debugger we go. I'll go grab my controller class for my, uh, my uh, Visual Force page. Here's the method you're going to be looking at remove cold accounts, appropriately named. And I'm going to be looping through, and if the rating was cold, I was supposed to take it out of the list. Everything should be, should be golden. So I'm going to set a breakpoint. 
right there. I'm going to come back over to my page. I'm going to do the, the appropriate action again, and I should get the same behavior. Again, it's going to spin. Please wait, because again, I've hit a breakpoint. So here we are. I didn't finish my other transaction. I have two threads debugging at once. I wasn't planning on showing that, but look, you can have two threads debugging at once. Here I am at this point in my, uh, in my execution. So I've run to this breakpoint. I can look at my variables, list to reduce. This is my 12 accounts. And I can see, uh, yeah, I got Burlington, Dickinson, Edge, Express, Gene Point. OK. And now I can start stepping through and seeing what's happening. My variables will change with me. Uh, I didn't do that one. The next one, it's going to be cold, so I'm going to remove it. Right? Equals cold, yep. OK, so we're removing that account. Step through to the next one. We should be getting there pretty soon. And I'm removing another cold account. All right, that was the one I wanted. That was Express Logistics. That was the one before that works. So and I'm going to keep stepping. I remove that. You see my debug out output building down here as I go system.debug lines. All right, now here I am. I'm at the right place. I've got my list. I look at all my items here and I see, OK, the next one up should be Edge. Edge should be the next one up. And I look at I, and I is 3. Why is I 3? I3 means it's looking at uh, uh, Grand Hotels. It's not looking at Gene Point, which is the one I wanted to do. And I can now see the whole, list, the whole list right there in one view. I can look at it, and I can understand what I've done wrong. I'm removing the items, and I'm not decrementing my, my iterator. That's why. I kept skipping ahead, and that's why the two next to each other weren't debugging. So now I can see this. I can see the information here. Before, what would we have to do? We have to write out a bunch of debug statements. We have to debug each variable. We have to go look at it. It's more work than we like to do. This is the kind of amount of work I like to do. So here we go. I put in an I minus minus here when I do a, do a removal from the, th the list. And I save. By the way, this is all part of the open source Eclipse plugin. We've already got a few contributions from some people. And I challenge all of you to, to add to the uh, project. And this debugger plugin will be a part of it as well. And uh, now if I come back over here and I reload my page, oops, sorry. and I click this button, and everything should go just as I planned. Come on, cold. Uh, Breakpoint's on there. No, I'm going to take it off. Yep, there we go. I've debugged it. I feel much better now. <laughs> and now the legend that I do write perfect code can be, uh, can be per uh, persisted into the future. So interactive Apex debugger, what do you get? You're going to get. A button that works. Set breakpoints in classes and triggers. Stop your execution, regardless of whether you come in from clicking save on a, on a UI page or from a, a batch class or some other endpoint. You're going to get the ability to view variables, not just class member variables, but the uh, contents of your S objects, collections of S objects, and the innards of some of our system types, things that are harder to see today until you're done using them. So you'll be able to see those things uh, in the Explorer. You'll be able to see the call stack. The call stack tells you where your transaction began tells you all the triggers that you've hit based on the DML you've done, where you've gone from each method into each method, so you can figure out how far deep in the stack you are. And you can go back up and down the stack and view variables at any point. All the standard actions that you expect to see, stepping in, running to your breakpoint, and last but not least, squished in this uh, screen format is the debug output is being written to the console so that you can go forward and see, you know, you, you still like to let, sometimes put those signposts in. Yes, I'm entering this method, and I added this. Now, that'll all show up in the console for you. The question you're probably thinking to yourself is, what took you so long? It's a fair question. I, uh, I joined the DevTools team two years ago, and I would say three or four months after, it was a question I started asking, why can't we do this? Uh, and there are two key problems that we have to worry about in, in putting this together. We have to worry about trust. We have to worry about affinity. Two key problems in creating a multi-tenant uh, multi debugger that succeeds in the multi-tenant environment. So let's go into those, trust. Trust is our number one value. Service protection is critical. We can't let anything we do, any feature we release, make anything that's out there slow down, stop working. Your critical business processes are at stake. We need those to continue running. Uh, in the multi-tenant environment, everything needs to play well with others. And this particular feature, as you'll see in a minute, might not necessarily always play well with others. So it becomes a concern when we're doing debugging. Part of the problem with that is that Apex lives in the transaction. One of, the, one of the nice things about Apex is that it runs right alongside your workflow rules. It runs right alongside any other Apex logic that's in there. It's not an API client that's going and doing an independent uh, uh, call every single time it's doing DML. It's running right alongside the rest of the stuff in the transaction. And that's where the issue comes in. So you're running, over a, you're running a transaction. 
pushing buttons and they're not doing anything. So when you start writing your, uh, running your code with Salesforce, it's not all that interesting until you get to write something to the database. And as soon as you write something to the database, you open up a database connection. That's that little black circle means. You're going to have that open in the entire transaction. One of our connections to the database was open through the entire transaction. And this is one of our scarce resources. We don't have all that many database connections to go around. Why does it need to be open? It's because in that transaction, you might do a bunch of things. You might update an account. You might update some contacts. You might also create some junction objects, add a couple tasks. Uh, and when you're done, all of these things at once will either commit or roll back. So they'll either be there or they will vanish together. And if the database connection vanishes, that will lose the ability to do that. So the one transaction has to happen with the database connection open the whole time. So where did I go to here? Huh? Buttons. Doesn't like that I changed. There we go. What happened? Technical difficulties, apologies. Where was I? I just rolled back. So now normally what it looks like this is this. Everyone see that? So normally what it looks like when you do a transaction watching is that. It's not there very long. These things happen almost instantaneously, so a transaction is usually going to give up its database connection right away. When you're debugging, though, it looks more like this. You go through, you step, you step, you look, you check some variables, you call your friend, ask him what the, what the problem might be, you look at the documentation. All that while the database connection is being held on to. So if you decide to get up and go to a meeting, or if there's a fire drill, or you take a nap, or you just forget to turn your computer off, that connection is still open. And that's a precious resource. And this is the problem that we had to worry about. When I first asked the question, uh, why don't we have this, the question I was asked back is, how are you going to do this without making this service fall over? The other problem is affinity. So you always see this cloud logo. As you may know, behind that cloud logo is a bunch of logos of servers with no software logos on them. What happens when a transaction comes in, it doesn't come to one place. It comes to, uh, it comes to all these places, but we route it to an available server, server three here. That's the one where that transaction went. But normally, that transaction is done. When you're debugging, that transaction is held open at a breakpoint on server number three. When you come back in and say, I'd like to step to the next point in the transaction, how do we know where it's supposed to go? And so this is the affinity problem right here. Because we've got a load balancer, we are not able to always know exactly where it is you want to go next. And so we need to find a way to break your transaction on any app server and then find it again when you came back and said, please step to the next. Please run to the breakpoint. Not as easy as it might seem. And so some people said to me, why can't you just do it the easy way? Just give me all the platform. I'll run it locally. Give me all my Apex code. And I'll stand it up. And I'll, and I'll debug on my local machine. And this certainly would solve both the trust and the affinity problem. There's no question about that. There are three issues with this one, one small and two that are pretty big. Smaller issue is that you have a single tenant environment here, not the multi tenant environment in which your actual problem exists. Sometimes that won't be a problem, but there will be those Heisenberg kind of things where, when you're looking at it here, it doesn't look quite the same as it looked in the multi tenant environment. So you're not going to find everything there. Small enough problem we could get by with it. In fact, we do a lot of debugging internally this way. The two larger problems, though, are the Salesforce platform is large, it's not just an app server and a database. There's FileForce, and there's uh, our MQ, and there's ACS, and 10, 15 different services that need to run. Streaming API, all these things need to run. It takes a lot to get the whole platform up to make a truly representative environment of what you're trying to debug. And even if you've got everything there, even setting it up correctly is not exactly the easiest thing in the world. The other difficult part is that while I mentioned the plugin is open source, and we're planning on releasing the compiler of Apex is open source, the whole platform is not ready for that yet. It's not at the point that we can just give it to people and say, here you go, and, and let people run it. So because of that, we're not able to even allow you to bring all the information over to your own computer. So the easy way is out. We can't do this, and that's why it took us so long. We've come up with a better solution, the cloud way. You get three, three things that come out of the box. Number one you've seen already is the Eclipse UI, a plug-in to, uh, plug to our plugin, where you can do debugging inside of Eclipse. Number two, an API. An API that uh, is loosely based on DBGP, uh, debug protocol, where it has all the commands you expect, run, step, uh, retrieve my variables, all those things that you'd need in order to do debugging uh, in a remote fashion. We've built an API that looks much like that, and then that's how we are communicating between Eclipse and the service. And the third piece, Session Manager. 
That's what answers the uh, affinity problem. We keep track of your session. It doesn't look quite like this drawing, but it's easy enough to draw it this way. When the next request comes in, we'll remember you. We'll remember where you came from, and we'll route your, your step and your get variable information to the appropriate server so we can send that information back to you. So we get a UI, we have an API, and we have some cool logic on the inside that allows us to live in the multi-tenant world without falling over. So how's this thing going to be set up? A little bit different. Some of you may have done some, some debugging kind of like this before. I think VB.net does debugging this way, but it's not the same as doing it under your box here. So you call out to Salesforce like I did, clicking the little bug, and you say, I want a debug session. It's a different kind of session. This session says to Salesforce, please run my whole org in debug mode. Any transaction that comes in, I want you to look at it and try to debug it. Says okay, let me go set some breakpoints in your code so that you know you pass those over. You can set them while running the session or at the start of the session. And then at that point, it's gonna put your Eclipse session to sleep. You're waiting. You're waiting for something to happen. That session is independent of the execute anonymous you run, or that uh, me clicking the visual force page. They're independent sessions. We have a debug session which is sort of overarching, looking over all the sessions that come into your org. So someone who looks mysteriously like you shows up and uh, goes into their browser and they'll run a transaction that hits a breakpoint. And when that happens, the debug session will be notified that, hey, a breakpoint has been hit. And as you saw, the browser session will be put on hold while the, while the debugging is happening, and your original Eclipse session will be notified and you'll be awakened. So separate sessions, not quite the same as sort of some of the debugging you would do, at least I've done in my past running with Java. The multi-tenant world works this way. All right, move to the good part, he says, the details, the fine print here. And this is the part where I'm going into the Q&A already because I'm anticipating some of the cues that you're going to have. And I'm going to add them now. Only one debugging session per org. It's going to be a little funky when debugging is going on because you might hit breakpoints. You might not hit breakpoints. While that transaction is running, it's holding on to locks longer than it normally does. It's going to be a strange environment. You wouldn't want to run this in your full production system because it's going to be a little funky. And if we have two debugging sessions, we'd never be able to figure out who was requesting what, that little blue box on the previous page. So uh, things are going to be a little slow when you're running in debug mode because we're just like if you had full logging on, it goes a little slower as we emit information. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, you, may, you can do this in, in multiple user org, but it's going to be basically targeted at you debugging in your development environment. Many of you are already there. Many of you are already working in your own sandbox. Uh, if it's in a multiple person environment, it's going to be a little trickier. But one session per org debugging. Speaking of sandbox, it's going to be sandbox only. Why is this going to be sandbox only? It's going to be sandbox only because if we do have some sort of you know, trust issue in sandbox, it doesn't cause nearly as much pain as we have in production. Sandbox is our sandbox environment. While people rely on it, it's not their full business data. So the sandbox, we have a little bit more flexibility there. We have a little bit more flexibility in some of the configuration we're going to do in terms of the database. Production, we're tuned for fast transaction for thousands of users simultaneously trying to do things. Sandbox, we don't quite the user volume, so we can do a little bit more and we can help scale up a little bit better in the sandbox environment. The next question some of you are asking, who's an ISV? Who works with an ISV partner, anyone? You guys are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't get sandbox, right? Yeah, so I know, I thought about you, we're working on this. We're going to make sure that ISVs are going to be able to get sandbox environments. Uh, there's some, some things that are in, the, in, the, in flight right now. Uh, we can already manually provision them, but we're going to get some ways for, for you guys to be on sandbox pods as well so that you can do this debugging. But just like the debug logs today, any code or variables that comes from a managed package is going to be blocked. So those of you who rose your hands as ISVs, you can rest easy. We're not going to be surfacing your code. We're not going to be surfacing your variables just like we, we hide them today in the debug logs. That sometimes will make things difficult if you're trying to debug an issue that involves some ISV code. And so if we have a plan to do something where it's going to be a, a joined mode, joint mode between subscriber and ISV, where either the ISV says, subscriber, I'm okay with you looking at my variables and you tell me what's going on, or the subscriber saying, I'm okay with you seeing all the debug outputs and, and, and looking at the debugging and you tell me what's going on. It's like buddy breathing mode where you got one regulator and you're both sort of working on the same thing at the same time. So that's plan. That's not part of the version 1.0 release. That's part of the... Uh, the, the longer term future. And I don't want to say limits, but we're going to have to have some sort of cutoff points here. I don't want to say limits because I don't want you sitting there spending 10 minutes building up your, your, your transaction and getting the variables just right and sitting down to look at it and realizing the timer is about to go off and your session is about to expire and the whole house of cards is going to fall down. That's no good. That's not a good exp uh, experience. If you do take a nap or if you do get up and leave, we do have to stop your session though. We do have to make sure that 
no one's hogging the conch and that people are able to go in and continue to do work uh, when you're done. So there will be some cutoff points that we're going to put in here. They're going to be a lot less restrictive than a, a simple transaction. Uh, we're going to know that you're debugging, so we're going to have a little bit more uh, leeway. But there's going to be some points at which we're going to have to say, all right, no mas, you've, you've been there long enough. And this is the part that I'm, I'm about to get thrown stuff at me. Uh, this is going to be a SKU that we're going to be selling at some point. I don't have any idea how much it's going to cost, but I'm going to make an analogy to the full copy sandbox. Full copy sandbox we charge for because data uh, uh, disk space is, is used when you make a full copy sandbox. And so it's not something we can just give everybody or we would run out of disk space. There is a finite cost to it. We start scaling this up, it's going to have the same issue. These are going to take up a finite resource, database connections. And in order to make sure that folks in the room here, who are the people that really need this and really want this, use this, we're going to have a nominal fee on this. So it's not just anyone who signs up to DE or can go hold on a, 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 a database connection and walk away. So there's going to be some, some sort of skew on this one. Doing everything I can to make sure that it's a price that everybody can handle uh, and you can use it, but it's not going to be something that's going to just be everyone's going to get. It's going to be something that those who need it, the partners who need it, and the customers who need it are going to have access to it. And that is the new debugger. So I want to say thank you very much. First, before I do anything, if you guys were going to clap, I wasn't going to let you because these are the guys who you need to clap for because these guys are doing all the work. So thank you guys for building a bugger. That's it. All right, so I figured I'd leave time for q and A. I I figured people want to know stuff. So please come to the mic. You've got the smartest people in the room in the room. So you mentioned there's a... Uh an API, is that, do you have third parties? Is, is that open to third parties like uh, Brain Engine and Maven's Mate? Yes, are sir. They, are they working on in, incorporating They are this? not yet, but the API will be part of the tooling API. So uh, Maven's and Brain Engine and any other tools that are out there can utilize uh, this protocol and they can build their own debugging interfaces. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you said there's going to be uh, like a, available at a charge. You're not sure what that is yet, but. Like, is that going to be available in like all kinds of development orgs, or is that going to get, have to get enabled on a per organization basis? How does that look? Still working on that. You're going to want your your environment already set up when you want to start debugging. You want to click the button and go. You don't want to do an org transfer into some pre-specified place. So your org will have to be pre-approved to debug, right? So I don't know if it'll be a debug debugging sandbox or if there'll be some sort of flag on sandbox, but we're going to set it up so that. Whatever environment you're in, if you're in the program and you're uh, a paying customer, you're going to be able to debug in your org. Yeah. Right. So I said sandbox only, but does that mean that you could? I mean, when you say sandbox, do you mean developer, normal developer orgs will not have access to this, or they will not have access? DE orgs run on production hardware, so this won't be available there. So we're going to have to have sandboxes available for for development. Okay. And you. like I said, we are working on making sure that people who are running in DE uh, do, does ISVs because they have to. We're going to make sure they can get access to a sandbox. Is this only yes, available on? Eclipse or Sublime Text? Or? We have implemented a, a plugin for Eclipse. Uh, any, like I said, it's, it's an API. It's going to be in the tooling API. So anyone who wants to integrate this to whatever other IDE will be able to do so. Thanks. And I forgot to say the most important thing, and no one even asked. I'm amazed. Uh, we're planning on piloting this uh, in spring. Planning on having a pilot uh, program for this. We're going to have to keep it to a small number of customers while we uh, get the, work the kinks out. We're hoping to release it in summer or winter of next year. So that's the plan. My question, but I have another question. I can't. Can you speak in the mic? Okay. The question I have is that today, when I want to you know, do a debug log on a, on a large class, right, with I think 2 meg or 3 meg limit on my log file. So, with this, I essentially don't have that issue at all. Right? So, I can have a large file, I can put a breakpoint anywhere, and then I can step there and all. Yeah, so today there's a limit on the size of the log, and you have to look at the whole transaction afterwards. This one, you're just looking at this point in time. So you're looking at one section of the log only. There's no limit on this one. Correct. Will you be able to set values through the debugger? Ah, good question. <laughs> Anyone want to take this one? Does this mic work? So the answer is not NV1. Uh, it's a fairly complicated thing, as you can imagine. Yes. OK, thank you. I'm talking about eval. You want I assume that also relates to running arbitrary code as well. I'm talking so. about eval. Anyone? Do you have say? No. <laughs> yes, we're, we, we've looked into that. It's right. complicated. Uh, no, really? <laughs> Thank you. But we would like to provide that in a later version, yes. Will you be able to set breakpoints uh, that are hit during future methods or batch call? Or? Hit there. 
future are you be able to hit breakpoints in future methods? Yes. Yes, the uh basically future and asynchronous stuff should work. Part of that is why we're sort of saying when you set the session up, you can set breakpoints everywhere in the org. It's sort of the easiest way to guarantee you can hit all of the asynchronous stuff also. Yeah, one just another note. Uh most of you probably know tests run asynchronously, so if you couldn't debug your test, you'd probably be annoyed at us, right? Huh. In your diagram there, you had one server that was the one stopped at a breakpoint. Is that server kind of stuck, and it's the other ones in the pool that are doing the normal work while you're at a breakpoint, or but the thread yeah. is stuck on that server, so your your thread remains at breakpoint. So if you had another request, it would go to another random server. But that request is going to live on that one server for the life of the request. Thank you. Tim? So, so it will break that uh, thread just for that specific user, not for other users. It will break any 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 session, any user in the org that hits a breakpoint. This is useful if you're doing some sort of user acceptance testing and there's a problem and you can't reproduce it because you're an Apex developer, so you've basically got sysadmin rights and you can't find the exact same conditions. You can have another user go in and they can do the work they're doing and they can reproduce the problem and you can see the you can do the debugging while they're running. And also the second question is it will be available in developer console or just in the Eclipse? This is going to be just in Eclipse, and the reason is Eclipse has a pre-built UI for us to hook into versus having to build our own set of buttons and windows and panes to make debugging look right. Uh, we're just going to leverage what's in Eclipse. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, is, there any, is there any reason we, like, you can't set up more servers that are specifically for debugging and take debugging requests so you can scale it up more? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, why can we set up things that were set up just to do debugging, right? Yeah. Uh, lots of ways to answer this. Our stack is pretty static. We don't change it much because changing it, in, it introduces risk. Uh, you don't like risk, I promise. You, you, you prefer things to be stable. We've talked about some other things that might work, like spinning up virtualized things that are different, but that's a lot of work and I don't know where it would run. Uh, so we've investigated it, but the most likely candidate to get something to work in the short term is for it to run in the sandbox environment. Is there a way for uh, third party ID developers to get uh, access to a debugger API? somehow earlier. I missed the question. Can you say it again? So is there a, w uh, a way for third party ID developers to get access to the bugger API earlier? Is there a way for us to get the API out to people early? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, we'll probably, I mean, we'll have the API logged down. We do pilot more or less. So yeah, it can be, I mean, I have no problem making available sort of the the API that we're setting up for pilot. We want to be able to change it in case it's not right. But yeah, we could probably, when the pilot goes out in the spring, we could probably put that in the, in the documentation, yeah. Thanks. Yep. So there's lots of reasons, good reasons, why if multiple developers are sharing a sandbox, but once you introduce one developer putting, of that scenario putting in a breakpoint, all the other developers doing testing are, you know, they're stuck. So is there a way to, or a plan, so that users can sort of identify themselves as it be excluded from the checkpoints that are, or breakpoints that are set by some other user? We originally discussed it being the other way, where you'd have to say, I'd like my, my, my work to be debugged. But as Mike pointed out, it's easier just to say everything's being debugged than try to have people explicitly set. You could think that the reverse would be possible. You could say, ignore this session. Uh, well, it's not on the plan for version one. So. Another point is that uh, I'm not sure how familiar your databases are, but if you are modifying an account, say, and another user is waiting on that account, whether or not they opt in, they are locked out of that account, right, while you're debugging because that row is locked in the database. So it wouldn't work anyway. It would work, but it'd be funky. It'd be right. undefined. Right. Kind of related to what he asked, is there any way that it could be a conditional breakpoint based on the user? It's in the plans. Not sure if we'll make it in the initial version or not. Okay. Yeah, like part of that is at some point you need arbitrary code execution in order to do a conditional breakpoint, and we sort of covered that is kind of a complicated mess. Just out of curiosity, will it also work for full developer pro and developer sandboxes? Full developer or 
uh, until, yeah, well, it would work. Role. It would work in. It yes. will work in any sandbox environment. Uh, like I said, I don't know exactly how it's going to be set up on a SKU base basis right now. Whether mm -hmm. the two will be independent or they'll just be a you know thing you can toggle in any org, or if there'll be a separate kind so we, of org. We, so we can use it in dev and then do a final uh, real smoke test with full before we go to production. Should be able to do debugging. Yes, and all. So you're saying you want to buy two licenses? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not my money. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your conference.